Hey, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. You know, if you live a full long life, let's say you live about 90 years of age, you live to be about 90, you, li- you die of natural causes. Most people, you know, somewhere between 80 or 90 die. You are going to be born around very different people than you die around. Maybe, maybe, if you're lucky, if you're fortunate enough, one of your siblings will be there your entire life. Somebody you were born, a brother or sister, that you were born knowing, you will also die knowing. But most of the people that you were born around when you were born, you will not die with. At the end of your life, there'll be a whole new set of people. You'll probably be born around your parents, obviously, maybe some siblings. And at the end of your life, you might be surrounded by your children or your spouse or other friends and other family. And what it really... I was thinking about this recently in the context of we are fundamentally alone in our lives as far as the one person that we have throughout the entire experience is ourselves. We have us and we interact with people throughout our lives, but ultimately it keeps coming back to we are the person that has been there the whole time. And then it led me to the thought of, of selfishness. This idea of through life, we are told the message repeatedly from the time we're very little until you're well into adulthood and throughout your entire life, don't be selfish. Stop being self-centered. Stop living for yourself. Start living for others. And don't be selfish. This is the message we hear. And I was thinking about this recently. I was thinking, why? Why is that a problem? Why is selfishness, being focused on the very person, the relationship that you have from the moment you're born until the moment you die, why have we demonized being focused on the self, being selfish. And I, I know that almost sounds like a silly question, maybe. You're listening, you're like, well, doesn't he know why selfishness is bad? I've got 10 reasons right here off the top of my head. Of course, selfishness is bad. You'd list all those reasons. But think about this for a moment. Just think about the question. If you didn't have to take all your preconceived notions about selfishness, whatever that means for you, why aren't we as people more selfish? You know, when that person tells you, maybe your, your spouse tells you you're being selfish, Aren't they being selfish and saying that to you? Aren't they saying, well, instead of you doing things in your own best self-interest, you should do things that please me. And it's like a selfish statement to say that too, right? To project selfishness onto somebody else, isn't that being selfish ourselves? I guess this is the question I have today. I'd like to talk about with you, Antonia, unpack this. It's something I've been thinking about a lot. I don't necessarily have the answers, but I've got a lot of questions around it. And we were talking a little bit offline, and I think neither one of us really have a a direction particularly we want to go. But I think this is a really interesting topic for me of why we assume selfishness is bad. I don't I don't know why, but that's an assumption that I've had in the past. And I think a lot of people have. Yeah. Well, and okay, so I've got a bunch of th- stuff that comes up for me. And, sure. uh, and actually, I mean, in the, in the spirit of full disclosure, this is a topic that you wanted to talk about. And I'm going to I'm going to let you guide this dance, if that's OK. Sure. I'm just going to follow your lead. But what comes up for me is first we have to define what we mean by selfishness. Like like at the beginning, what do we mean by selfishness? Do we simply mean following our own self-interest, pursuing the things that make us happy? Are we talking about doing it at the cost of or, or exploitation of others? Like what exactly do we mean by selfishness? Well, I would say how I define it is from this standpoint, from this viewpoint, is doing things that will make us happy. So I'm going through life and I only have the moment I'm in right now and how I feel about the moment I'm in right now or how I think about the moment I'm in right now. And at any moment, that is, from this point of being selfish, that is the most important element of everything else going on because I can't experience anything except for that. I can't experience your happiness or your frustration, or your joy, I can only experience my own. And so I have to take full and total responsibility for how I'm feeling, how I'm expressing, and how things are happening in my life, because I'm the only one that can take responsibility for that. So that's how I'm defining it, as being selfish for how I am showing up in this moment, which is all I actually have. I don't have the past or future, I only have right now. And I think using that as a definition or as a guide, I think it's not difficult or a difficult leap to make that we actually are always selfish because that is the only experience we have, the the experience of the self, our own subjective experience. Then 
even when we're doing things for other people, like you said, I can't experience your joy, but I can experience whatever sympathetic joy I have based on your joy. Like I can tune my joy to yours. So when I do things to create joy in you, it is fundamentally selfish because then I get to like use you as a tuning fork for my own joy. And whenever I do anything for another person, even if it's not something that like joy, maybe it's a fear that you won't like me if I don't do it, then it is a desire to get you to approve of me. And I need that reassurance. And so that goes back to my experience and feeling the experience that I want to have. So one could argue that our entire lives are selfish. Everything we do is about fundamental self-interest. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because it is effectively how we're wired. That is how we are designed. I think what becomes a very interesting question in amongst this concept of selfishness is what is the best way to be selfish? Like what is the highest quality way a person can be self-interested? Yeah. Well, I think from a biological standpoint, picking back on what you just said, selfishness at a biological level means I want myself to live more than I want any other organism to live. So in a survival situation, we're under a bear attack, like the ultimate selfishness in that in that framework or that situation would be me not caring where you are in the situation with the bear. I just turn and I run for the hills as fast as I can to get away from the bear. And I'm totally interested in my own selfish survival. And so I think I think one of the things that makes this hard to define is at what what point in reference to our survival are we talking about? Are we talking about the actual survival of there's six people in a lifeboat and one person has to get out or we're all going to sink? Who gets to be selfish and stay in the boat and who has to self-sacrifice and get out at the survival level? And I feel like that's always where it comes back to. Anytime we're in the conversation with selfishness, it always gets brought back to the biological level because it's almost like that was where us humans started out at first. Like, hey, let's not kill other people. If there's a survival situation, let's try to make all of us be able to survive in this, not just one person get out alive. So we have this like this idea of selflessness, which would be making sure other people are also taken account for. It seems like the selfishness and selflessness conversation, the underpinning assumption is that we're always talking about a survival level of something. Even on that level, though, I can't help but believe that the people... and. I think that we have a word for somebody who's willing to sacrifice the self in behalf of others. I think that word ends up being the word hero. Like the ultimate example of a hero is somebody who either kill, like allows themselves to be killed or puts themselves in harm's way in order to save another person's life. Like they're at that level of selflessness. And, and so we have a word for that because we admire it so much and in part because it's so rare that a, that desire, not even desire, that willing, willingness to do that. But I think what happens in those situations is that if you strip it all back to survival, even back one level beyond our own personal ego, is the species desire to survive. Like we as a collective human experience have a desire to continue living as humans because we recognize that my individual survival is intrinsically linked with our survival and we all know we're going to die but our dna lives on and so there's that that is super super ancient stuff super ancient is this desire as a species to keep going And I think the people who are willing to put themselves in harm's way or even die in behalf of other people's lives, I think that that is an example of being really tapped into that ancientness, being really tapped into that idea that it's not really about any single one person, it's about us and our our need to survive as a conglomeration. And so usually uh, a person will put themselves in that position when they deeply, deeply understand that piece. This makes me think of, I I don't know if I've mentioned this on the podcast before, I talk about it endlessly, so I would not be surprised if I've mentioned it multiple times on the podcast. We've just not done a a complete episode on it. But I've recently gotten really into Simone de Beauvoir's philosophical concept of existentialism, where she talks about existential um, ethics. And she wrote a very long essay, you could say it's a short book, called The Ethics of Ambiguity. And 
the philosophy is because there there's an argument that when you, when you are an existentialist, which is effectively a a philosophical position that we got dumped on the planet and we have no idea how we got here. And so that's not really the most interesting thing. The most interesting thing is how do you live a life of meaning or happiness or anything positive if you have no intrinsically built in meaning or purpose? Like if you don't have a story, maybe a religious or God story or any other philosophical story that says that you have meaning and purpose, if you feel like you just got dumped here on the planet and you can't know the origin tale or you can't know the origin, how do you have any sort of purpose or meaning in your life? And then the next question is, why would you ever do anything ethical or moral? Like, wouldn't you only ever do bad things to other people because there is no meaning wrapped up? And her her essay, long again, long essay, short book, The Ethics of Ambiguity, is an argument that actually eth- existentialism has a lot of ethical implications built into it. One of them being what she calls the ambiguity. And the ambiguity is this concept that we are subjects to ourselves and we are objects to everyone else. And you're an object to me and I'm a subject to me, whereas you're a subject to yourself and I'm an object to you, right? So that's the baseline is that I am my own subject and every other human being on the planet is an object. And her argument is that it's not whether or not you focus on the subject, because a lot of philosophy focuses on one or the other. It either focuses on the individual subject of my experience or it focuses on the obligation and duties we have to the objects of everybody else. And her position is it's actually the tension between the two that creates ethics. It's the, it's the push-pull relationship between me as an individual subject and everybody else as an object. And then I have an obligation to both, just like everybody has an obligation to both. And it's the tension between the two. It's like the relationship, the dynamic between the two that actually creates all of our ethical implications. And that's kind of what we're talking about. As a subject, I am going I am going to be closer to my subjective experience than I am to anybody else, regardless of the level of intimacy I am with that person. Like I would say you and I are the deepest level of intimacy I've ever experienced with another person, except for you know maybe my mother when I was breastfeeding. Like you and I, as an adult, you are the most intimate creature I've ever like I've ever experienced or our, our relationship is the most intimate. And yet still, I am much closer to my experience than I am to yours. So I will always, always have my experience at hand, no matter what is going on. So I, of course, I'm going to go for my self-interest. Of course, I am. I'm not going to even think about it. It's just going to be there. And yet, at the same time, I am deeply invested in your experience. Like, your experience directly impacts mine, so I am deeply invested in yours. And the more you understand the relationship we have to all the other objects around us, all the other people around us, the more we realize how intrinsically networked we are together, we recognize that we can't have an optimized experience unless everybody else is also experiencing something relatively optimized. And so that tension of wanting the best for others while at the same time wanting the best for ourselves is an entire philosophical concept which I've actually become very persuaded by I I find her I find the ethics of ambiguity to be like one of the most probably one of the most compelling books I've read in a very long time yeah same here I mean I think I think that the concept of the the tension between things the it's basically the relationship we're talking if you go listen to one of our podcasts on systems thinking this idea that everything is systemic. There is no cause and effect. Everything's an emergent property of a system. I won't go into any more detail than that. You can listen to the podcast on systems thinking. This idea of us being subjects to ourselves and objects to others plays into that. We're all part of a giant system in a sense. We're each playing a node in a way in that system. It's not so much about the node itself. It's about the relationship between nodes in a system that really create the system and the emergent of the system. So I think that I think that, that that is a really great thought. I, I see it from a... So I want to pivot into like a practical thing. I was raised very much seeing myself in terms of service to the objects of people around me. In other words, the way I was raised in my religious paradigm and my family structure and the culture I was raised in here in the United States, I was raised to put others first. Well, actually raised to put God first, others second, and my, myself last. You're, you're, you come very, very, very last, Joel, after everyone else is satisfied, after God is honored, et cetera, et cetera. You fall way down the line. I'm basically third in line for everybody else on the planet. And I can see why this sprung up. I mean, if everybody's 
if everybody is uh, fighting over resource and we don't see other people in our framework, we're gonna have we're gonna have complete chaos. So you need structure, I guess, in in our society. Once you get into a society level, a cultural level, that helps us function. I mean, you know, we see. I think I think the freeway is a great example. People that are selfish drivers cause problems for everybody because they're only interested in their their speed or their the lane they want to be in on the freeway, and it causes a lot of ripple effects for everybody else driving. So, I get the fact that we have to be there. And one of the things I've been trying to do is rewire myself. And I probably at moments in the past few years have swung too far to the other direction. Not all the time, but I've had these moments when I've been really a jerk to people, like trying to get a sense of myself, my own identity, and not always serving others first, just because I was wired that way. I'm sometimes recalibrating and the pendulum swinging the other direction. And I've I've been hostile toward people in the last few years. I've been mean. This hasn't been a regular thing, but I've seen myself behave badly toward people. I had to apologize or reconcile with the way I've behaved because I've tried to see myself more as a subject rather than an object, be more creating my own reality, seeing myself on that side. And I think that it comes down to this idea of, I had this assumption that self-interest, selfishness was inherently at its fundamental core, just the idea of being selfish was bad and wrong as an assumption. And I'm questioning that assumption now. I'm questioning the fact that I don't know. It's almost like this idea of putting an oxygen mask on an airplane, right? It would be selfish. You, know, you would look at somebody, a mother that puts her oxygen mask on before she helps her daughter. Let's say our daughter Piper's traveling with us. If I put my oxygen mask on first and then I help Piper, well, that's selfish. You should take care of your child first. But actually, that's the exact opposite of what you should do. You'd pass out otherwise. You have no oxygen to be able to take care of your child. So you take care of yourself first, and then you assist others. And it's this almost stretched metaphor to other things. And this may not be new for you if you're listening. You might already have this concept rattling in your brain. But do you really? I mean, do you really show up to the world acting in your own self-interest? Or is that a nice thing you say? And you're like, oh, I already know this. I already thought about this. And you still behave like you've always behaved. You just have this like thought rattling around. So to me, I don't think I want to show up to the world being an asshole to people. I don't think that's what I want to do. That doesn't feel good to me. It's that tension like you talked about, that ambiguity between other people also having their own subjective experiences and me having my subjective experience and being able to create a situation where all of that can be honored. But when it comes down to it at the end of the day, unless it's a survival survival thing, should I be acting in my own self-interest more than I already am? I think you made, I mean, you just kind of touched on this really briefly, but I think it's, it might be the core component of the question of whether or not one should be selfish or pursue one's own self-interest is you indicated that it's almost like a level of development when you are very young and you don't understand, like you don't have as as sophisticated that a concept of what they call theory of mind. I think we've talked about theory of mind before on the podcast. And a theory of mind is a developmental concept or phenomenon that happens in children that around the age of four or five, they start to realize that other people have independent thoughts from their own. Meaning that, and and, and I, think we've, I think we've mentioned this before, but the study that is the easiest to understand this concept of theory of mind is that at a certain age, maybe three or four, if you sit with a child and take a box of crayons and pull all the crayons out of the box and stuff it with candy and then invite a new adult or a new person to walk in and you ask the child, what does that person think is in this box? They'll say candy because the child watched the candy be put into the crayon box. But around four or five, sometimes six years old, if you run that same exercise you know all over again and you say what does that person think is in that box they'll say crayons because they know the person was not in the room when the crown box was stuffed with candy so it's this idea that other people have their own experience separate from yours and it's called theory of mind and as we become more mature and more sophisticated we get better and better at understanding theory of mind, which another word for saying theory of mind or sophisticated theory of mind is perspectiving, being able to shift into somebody else's perspective and recognize that they are experiencing something very different and very real to them. Whatever it is that they're experiencing is just as real to them as whatever you're experiencing yourself. But until you get to a level of understanding what 
you know, that that ability to perspective or that ability to understand that somebody else's experience is just as real to them, then selfishness is more of a default setting. You just do whatever you want to anyway because you don't understand the implication of how you're behaving towards others. You don't understand that the things you do can actually hurt them. And I recognize this as an individual. Like, I, I've not been great at perspectiving. That has not been the thing that I was that great at, even well into my 20s. It took coaching and it took really great friends who taught me the skill of perspectiving to get to that point. I would do really like kind of shitty things to people (laughs) and not really recognize what I was doing because I didn't think that they would care about that thing. And then come to find out later, it didn't matter if I thought that they would care. They did care. And so it was not an acceptable behavior to perform towards them. So it was something that like I, I came on for me later in life was really being able to understand that principle. But I think the the teaching or the uh, insistence that I think a lot of you know parents and maybe even religious entities or other institutional entities when they're saying don't be selfish put yourself last I think it's a developmental level to get people from very low theory of mind to not have those people do a lot of damage in the world by not understanding the implications of their actions. And so if they get coached in to thinking I come last, it's like a it, it's almost like a hack. It's like a teaching or belief hack to get them to recognize that other people also have an experience and you should be honoring that experience. But I think it's just a developmental level. I don't think it should be codified as a like a lifelong concept. I think once the theory of mind is sophisticated enough, once the perspectiving ability is sophisticated enough, then I think it's very appropriate to bump up to the next place, which is like, no, no, I get to do for me too. Like I'm also part of that equation. I'm not, I'm not just here to serve everybody else's interests. And especially since most people are not doing that for you. The only way that works is if everybody's doing that for you too. Like that's the only way to keep that sustainable. If you are going to 100% live for everyone else, the only way to make that a sustainable arrangement is that everybody else is living for you too. And that is usually not the situation that people find themselves in. That is a very rare situation. And so if you're not experiencing that, then it is time to reframe again. It is time to go, no, I'm part of this equation too. I'm a subject just like everybody else is. I don't have to see myself as an object. In fact, I can't see myself as an object. I only experience myself as a subject. So if I'm treating myself like an object... And I'm treating everybody else like a subject. That's the opposite of how it works. And I'm going to feel lots of icky feelings. And I'm probably going to build some resentment because I'm fighting against the natural order of things. So once you have the ability to perspective, it is now time to move into a place where you make sure that you recognize that you have your own needs. You have basically a duty to treat yourself as well as you can in order to be at the best place possible the metaphor is putting on your oxygen mask first to be at the best place possible in order to be a better servant to others. And if you need to spend some time just focusing on that oxygen mask, so be it. I'm getting more clarity as we talk around, I think, the questions I have. And I think when it comes to physical things like driving on the freeway or if you're at a buffet and you know a family dinner and everybody's in like line and you jump ahead of the line and push everybody out of the way to get food first or you know you're sitting down and you're eating a meal and you feed yourself before your children i, I could see an argument to say you know maybe you want to be less selfish in your life you're you're really grabby all the time i've been around people like that and that's very distasteful i think i have more nuance i think this is coming down to me for me now at the mimetic an emotional level. I think that's really where I think it's insidious when somebody tells me that I am selfish for feeling certain emotions or I am selfish for having mimetic strategies or thoughts and I should have their emotion or their mimetic thoughts or strategies. And if I don't, I'm being selfish. I think I'm getting a lot of clarity that that's really where this resonates, this idea of being selfish resonates with me. Not necessarily being an asshole and pushing people out of the way in a physical way. And I think I was hitting on this in the survival element at first as we we're going down that road. And the clarity came to, it's not so much about physical stuff. It's more for me about mimetic and emotional stuff. So let me use the example of both of us have left the religion of our youth. Now, my situation is a little different. My family, it's not such a rigid, I mean, it's, 
it's a rigid religion. They have a lot of things that they believe, and there's some there's some break in relationship that I've had, some intimacy, I should say, not relationship. But I don't have as close an intimacy with some of my friends and family because I've decided to integrate and transcend some of the things I was raised with. And I, I try not to be as hostile at all toward that. I try to really hold a lot of space. But you are in a situation where it's a very black and white religious structure. You're either in or you're out. It's a very clean cut line. It's not so fuzzy like mine is. Mine's a lot more nuanced, which actually makes it a little more difficult in some ways. But your parents, basically, I don't know if they've ever used these words, but your parents, because they don't have a relationship with you now, it's not just intimacy, it's any relationship. They have to work through me to communicate with our family because you guys can't communicate. They basically have indicated that you are being selfish for choosing not to believe mimetically and paradigmatically the way they believe. And that's, I think, really, that's a great example of what I'm talking about here. You probably, if you're listening, have someone in your life, you've made a choice to feel a positive emotion in your life. And they love the fact that you feel negative emotions before this. Or you've chosen to transcend maybe the religion or the culture or the political structure you were raised with. And they've said to you, you're being selfish. You should come over and do what you've been doing before. And I guess in that framework, I say, well, why is that person not being selfish in requiring you to come to their mimetic structure? Why is that person not being selfish in requiring you to have the emotions they want you to have? Isn't that also being selfish on their point? Aren't they being hypocritical by projecting that onto you? And so I think that's really, as we talk, that clarity is coming to me. I think that's what I'm resisting in life. And sometimes I... I probably am acting because of that. And there's, there's these things I'm working on. Sometimes I let that spill over into pushing my way around on the freeway. Like I'll cut off somebody because I'm like, I'm, I'm asserting my, my self-interest and I'll like cut that guy off on the freeway and cause him to flip me off or something like this. And I have to, and then I got to feel through that. Okay. How'd that feel? Do I like cutting people off on the freeway? I don't know how I feel about that, but it's me getting to an attempt. It's actually me on a physical level, trying to get a mimetic freedom of self-interest and an emotional freedom of self-interest. These are my emotions. These are my mimetics. You don't get to tell me what they have to be. And I think that's really the core of what I'm talking about as we talk. It's becoming very clear. The major things that comes from the willingness to be self, selfish, self-centered, self-interested when it comes to emotions and memes or paradigms is that if you marry that with a desire to be the best version of yourself, the combination of those two things actually makes you one of the most powerful forces for good that I think we experience as people with our higher levels of consciousness and our ability to infect each other with idea viruses and our ability to influence the world and and a world that just absolutely is just dying for leadership. I mean, you can tell that people are dying to be led. They want so badly to have something that they can lean into and have some sort of like answer or have something that will, you know, paint a positive message or a, a, a meaning or purpose. People want leadership so bad. If you can marry this idea of, I get to have my own emotional experience and I get to have my own memes paradigms, belief structures, thoughts, etc. mindsets, if you marry that with also wanting to be the best version of yourself, being in integrity and in alignment with your, your, with your highest self, that is the one-two combination of the best leaders that we have. I don't think you can get there without being selfish around that. I don't think you can give that away to other people and still get there. I think you have to take a selfish view of those meme structures of those emotions you want to feel. I don't believe you can do that outside of that selfish selfish frame. Yeah, I, I agree. Well, and, and what's interesting is you can actually do that within, say, a religion you were raised in, as long as that religion is 100% congruent and in integrity and alignment with who you are. Like, if you, if you are at all, even on an unconscious level, resisting that belief structure, you're just never going to have the effect that you want. But if you're 100% in alignment with it, if, it is, if you are being selfish at the same time by going, this is what I believe, this is what I want to believe, this is who I am, like in a very profound way, I think you can have a lot of leadership power within that belief structure. I think that de definitely works out. I'm not saying that every person 
once they become selfish with their memes, automatically say resist what they were raised with or resist whatever they've they're they're currently in. But if you aren't one hundred percent in alignment with it, if you are handing that over to other people, you are your power is one hundred percent mitigated. Like you just will not have the power of influence that you may want or the power of impact because you're now dealing with this thing where you're handing so much over to other people and you have allowed yourself to become an object to their subjectiveness. Like you've handed over your ability to be selfish in that way. You have decided that you're going to put it aside for their selfishness and you did it for your selfishness on a more uh, like a like a deeper not a deeper but like a sort of more base level of wanting approval or wanting somebody else to like give you like that positive hit of whatever emotion is the thing that you feel is scarce. So it does, again, route back to selfishness, but not a heightened, not a high vibration selfishness, not like a best self selfishness, like a low self, low vibration version of selfishness, which is that I can't live without somebody else's approval. So I think it can look that way, like like basically being in alignment with the religious belief that you were raised with. I think most of the time, though, when a person takes that power back for themselves and allows themselves to be emotionally and mimetically selfish I think there's usually at least one or two variances like they're going to do it their own way at least in some slight way like it might be they might have the foundation of that maybe political belief or that religious belief or whatever is the institution they might have like a lot of the same concepts but there's something that is tailored to them and how they see the world and i think just being able to take that power for yourself is a pretty big one so there's another distinction emerging then here and that is that we are always behaving selfishly we trick ourselves to think we're not but if we're looking at our parents for example that want us to believe a meme structure a paradigm or people that want us to have an emotion, or friends that want us to feel a certain way, we're going to go ahead and do that, but we're being selfish on a lower vibrational channel in order to appease people to still feel good about ourselves. So it's not that we're not being selfish. It's not like we're really being selfless in that moment. In fact, we may be even, even be being more selfish in that framework because we're not showing up to the world to provide value anymore. We're just appeasing others around us. And we're like looking for that quick low vibration hit. And where if we can shift that into higher and higher levels of, look, if I go for the things that actually resonate with me, if I go for the, the memes and the paradigms and the beliefs and the emotions that I feel are the right ones for me, and I fully feel congruent or authentic with those, that then, then I get to, f- to show up to the world as, as like you said, showing up looking and striving to be the best version of myself. And it's almost like I, I rest into people that if that is where they're aligning, if that's where they're headed, they actually won't appear to the outside to be selfish at all. In other words, they're going to show up. If, you're, if your highest value, let's say your value is to honor everybody, but your religious paradigm tells you that a certain subset of people are wicked or bad or wrong or sinful... But you have this value internally and you take control of that and say, no, I want to honor everybody I show up around. I don't want to see anybody as that. You show up to the, the people that your religious paradigm, for example, I'm just an example pulling out of my head, may demonize a certain subset of people and you say, no, I'm going to love those people for who they are. You know, not just, not just if they come onto my side or anything. I'm going to love them for who they are, as they are, in their current condition, in their current state, whatever their belief is. And you actually end up expressing yourself in a more positive way toward those people, weirdly enough, by being selfish with your own memes and your own paradigms. So I, I feel like I feel like I trust that people going down this road will actually end up behaving to the outside observer less selfish, ultimately, by being selfish around their memes, paradigms, and belief structures. And I think the the most obvious example of this working out in a good way in a way that appears quite selfless maybe even in a hero way is when a person marries mimetic and emotional selfishness with the the high vibration and the best version of themselves oftentimes they find a mission and at that point when you find a personal mission you have to be selfish you have to believe that your mission is more important than anybody else's mission and you're going to spend your life doing that thing and crafting your entire life around getting your mission accomplished. And that is incredibly selfish because there's a lot of people who have a lot of missions. Now, 
I think you can be somebody who is being selfish in the best way possible. That high, like let's call it high vibration selfishness. I think you can have high vibration selfishness and align yourself to somebody else's mission. I think that's totally acceptable as long as it's in a full alignment with yourself. But then that means that you've got the cost of specialization. It means that this one mission, regardless of whether or not it's yours or you're supporting somebody else's, that means that you've said no to everybody else's mission and you're being very selfish for that particular thing that you think is important. But that's ha- that is the only way we get anything done is to have people focusing on different things that are meaningful to them and working on strategizing and problem solving one thing at a time. If you, if you focus on everything, you focus on nothing. So that high vibration selfishness is the only way that we're going to solve challenges in the world. So I think it's a no-brainer. I think it's very clear and obvious that that is something that we need to be moving toward. And I think if you are the type of person that tends to give away your emotions to others, I would encourage you to be more selfish with your emotions. You, you have the right to be very protective and selfish around feeling good, feeling the positive emotions you want to feel. I think ultimately positive, not short, quick hits where you take advantage of other people and feel good about that or feel like, aha, I won or I got mine. I'm talking about the authentic expression of feeling positive and joyful in your life. If people are taking that from you or requiring you to hand it over to them, don't let them do that. I think it's totally appropriate to be selfish for your emotions, to allow positive emotions to express themselves. Now, if you're being selfish for negative emotions, I don't know. I don't know if I agree with that, but it's your, your, your choice to determine that for yourself. And, and your level of selfishness around that. But I think that the positive emotions you want to feel, it's okay to be protective of those and not just hand them away. I would love to hear, we would love to hear what you are thinking around this. What has come up for you? This conversation is very open-ended, very free-form discussion, and we want you to be part of it. Your voice is needed. Your voice wants to be heard here. Come over to personalityhacker.com. Leave a comment or ask a question directly below this show. And let's get a conversation started in the community around this idea of selfishness. And the, the other thing is if you want to join a community of like minds, people very similar to you that are interested in personality types, in personal growth, in figuring out how to be the best version of themselves, find out their mission, their passion, their purpose in life, you can join that community over at facebook.com forward slash personality hacker or twitter.com forward slash personality hack, H-A-C-K. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. And if you are feeling particularly magnanimous and would like to give us a gift, you can leave us a rating and review on iTunes. That helps us out a lot. Yeah, we'd appreciate it. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. We will talk with you on the next Personality Hacker podcast. Personality Hacker.